Hi there everybody. Today I'm very excited to introduce to you a new frame design. This is the AOS T3 and it's my take on a 3 inch toothpick class drone. I'm going to be taking you through the resonance analysis of the T3 frame, some black box log analysis, and I'm going to be showing you some flight footage as well as taking you through every part of the design and this example build on the bench. But before we do that, I'd like to talk you through my philosophy behind the AOS T3 frame. Now, I'm a big fan of Bob Ruge's TP3 frame and the 3-inch toothpick class in general. I think they're relatively inexpensive and simple to build. They have pretty good durability because they're so light and their very lightweight gives them a very unique flight feel. It's very agile, it's very direct, it's point-and-shoot piloting. And because the consequences of crashing are pretty low, you can really fling these tiny drones through some fantastic acrobatic moves. But for a class that's so focused on flight performance and flight enjoyment, they do have a bit of an Achilles heel, which is that toothpick frames tend to have very poor vibration and resonance performance. And the reason is that they use very long and thin springy pieces of carbon fiber for the arms. And you put a mass, like a motor, on the end of a long, thin piece of carbon fiber, and you're going to create effectively a tuning fork that has a lot of uh, resonant energy that it, can, that it can generate, and it tends to occur at a pretty low frequency because those arms are so thin. So the AOS T3 is designed to give you that 3-inch toothpick performance that you love, but address that key shortcoming by having really good vibration and resonance performance that's going to allow you to run less filtering and higher degains and therefore really capture and capitalize on that agile and direct flight feel that toothpick frames have and hopefully you'll have more fun flying this than any toothpick frame before it. So let's get into looking at the frame in detail. So let's take a look at the AOS T3 on the bench. Now the philosophy of this frame was very much to improve on and develop Bob Ruge's original TP3 3-inch toothpick frame design. And the things that I really loved about that frame was that it was relatively simple, relatively lightweight and pretty durable. But I think one of the challenges or limitations with that frame design was in its resonance performance. It used very long, very thin pieces of carbon fiber for the arms. And that combined with the, the size of the motor that you typically run on these 3-inch toothpicks meant that the arms resonated quite a lot. And they resonated both in a bending mode, like this, and also in a torsion mode, in a twisting mode, like this. And that resonance really ends up limiting the, the overall flight performance that you can achieve with the frame. If a frame has resonance issues, you have to run more filtering, which increases latency and delay in the whole uh, PID loop. And you also have to run lower P and D gains than you would ideally like to in order to avoid oscillations and hot motors and smoked motors and things of that nature. So the AOS T3 really attempts to address those resonance issues whilst maintaining all of the good things that I really liked about Bob Ruge's TP3 frame. So if we start by looking at the motor mounts, this uses a standard 9x9mm motor mount, which is going to be typical for things like 1303, 1204 and 1105 motors that you might want to run on a 3-inch toothpick like this. The arms are 2.5mm thick, and you can see that they have a one main strut with a secondary bracing strut here. And this bracing strut serves two purposes. The first is it provides additional stiffness in bending because it effectively supports the arm at the midpoint there. And the second advantage that it gives is a tremendous increase in torsional stiffness. When you're trying to twist the end of the arm, which is one of the key resonant modes for toothpick frames like this, this strut here makes the base that was resisting that torsional moment much, much wider. And it also shortens the length of the arm that's unsupported against that, that torsional mode. 
So the result is that the arm ends up being tremendously more stiff, both in bending and torsion. And that addresses the key resonance challenge that the TP3 had. If we look at the rest of the design, the rest of the design is really trying to serve the arm design as elegantly as possible. So we have a bottom plate here. It's a very simple bottom plate with a cutout and it's designed to fit a 12 millimeter or up to a 15 millimeter battery strap actually. So you can just poke that through there and that's going to allow you to mount whatever battery you want to use with the frame really, really easily and securely particularly if you use some something like Umagrip or uh, 3M Dual Lock on this section here, it's going to really allow you to stick the battery down really firmly. The top plate you can see has these eight M2 press nuts fitted into it. And this is one of the elements of the design that I, I really like and I think is quite elegant, is that these eight press nuts allow for 25 millimeter mounting if you put the long screws on the corners or 20 millimeter mounting if you put the long screws through the middle of the sides of the frame. So whichever mounting pattern you want to use, whether it's a 25 millimeter all in one or a 20 by 20 stack, you just put the long screws in the right position in the frame and that's going to give you the mounting that you want. And it's not going to add any weight to use either of those two mounting patterns. So that's something that I think makes the frame pretty easy to build in. Should you need to change an arm, it's, it's unlikely on frames this size that you will break an arm, but even if you do, it is two screws and one of them is going to be shared with your electronic stack. But what I found is that if you use spacers rather than nuts on your stack, you can just draw one of these long screws out and the other three screws are going to hold everything in place and allow you to swap that screw with, with minimum difficulty. And then you would just take out, let's say, this screw and this screw. The arm would come out. You'd replace it and put the screws back. And this screw should go back straight up through the stack where it left. And hopefully nothing will move. It should be absolutely fine. At least that's been my experience when uh, swapping arms on this frame. And that's really all there is to it. One thing that uh, one of my patrons did mention as being a concern was whether the screws were going to flex in a crash and potentially cause the electronics to move. And what you can see here is they really don't at all. I'm flexing that quite a lot and those screws are remaining completely rigid. And that's because of these press nuts. When you put a screw like this through a press nut and cinch it down reasonably tight, it provides a tremendous amount of support for the screw as it goes through that carbon. And so there's really no room for it to move and flex and bend in a crash. And so you can be really confident that your electronics is not going to have any issues with screws moving um, in a crash situation. So let's take a look at a built T3 now and go through the components that I've chosen and the types of builds that I expect people to do with this frame. Starting with the, the motors and the props, which I think are the most important thing. I'm using the iFlight 1303 3000 kV motors for this build. And this is designed to be run with a 3S battery. And I'm using a 3-inch bi-blade prop. And this is what I would recommend for this frame. Um, a motor of around 1303 or 1204 or maybe 1105 in size. And a 3-inch bi-blade prop that's going to give you the, the best flight performance on this frame. If we look at the stack, you can see here that I'm using a 25 by 25 millimeter stack. The flight controller in ESC is the iFlight Beast F7 V2. And then what I've got here is a naked Cadex Vista on top. Now, what I've found with the naked Vista is that if you take the outer holes of the Vista, and you drill them out with a 2.5 millimeter drill bit very, very carefully, then they will fit perfectly on top of a 25 by 25 millimeter stack. So they match up with the holes on the all-in-one and you can assemble the thing without any issues. One thing that I did notice and I would advise you guys to be careful of when you're building out a naked vista is that these pieces of metal that uh, have the flex connector attached to them come with little stainless steel sponges when it's assembled in the Vista. 
I would remove those sponges because I had an experience where they actually shorted out on one of the components above the uh, the sponge and caused a problem. So the flex connector here remove the sponges on top of it so that you don't get that problem. You won't get a short, and then you should be able to build everything out just fine and use spaces or nuts um, to just keep those two boards separated. And that gives you know. I'm running this with a Cadex Nebula Pro camera. You could also use the new Nebula Pro Nano, which is even a bit lighter. It's going to give you even better flight performance. And it's just awesome to fly um, on DJI 120 FPS. An alternative strategy is to go with something like HD Zero or SharkBite or even an analog setup. And there you can use, I would use the 25 millimeter SharkBite board. That would be my preference. Uh, and then you could build it just on top of this stack here and put your receiver um, on top there as well. When choosing an antenna for this build, I would definitely advise going with something like this iFlight Sigma. Um, I'm using a left-hand circularly polarized for DJI. And you can see it's a very long, sort of thin, whippy style antenna. And I've got it secured here really tightly down to the arm with a cable tie. And that's preventing vibration. And one of the key things with a frame like this is that it's designed to be low vibration. So you want to make sure that your antenna mounting and your camera mounting and other things like that are also well secured and aren't going to vibrate. And your X-T60 as well, make sure that's secured nicely and so it's not going to vibrate. Otherwise, that's going to be your primary source of vibration rather than the frame. The battery that I would recommend for the AOS T3 is this 450 milliamp power 3S from Tattoo, or something similar like this 450 milliamp power 3S from Earsheen. You could also go a little smaller, maybe 400 or 350 milliamp power, but I've tried flying this on 2S, and I much prefer it on 3S. I think it has a lot more power, there's a lot more excitement in the flying, and you've got a lot more. Um, thrust to get yourself out of difficult situations or pull off more challenging freestyle moves. So yeah, I would definitely advise going for a 3S battery somewhere between 300 and 450 milliamp hours. If you're interested in my recommendation for what parts to use on an AOS T3, whether you're running DJI Digital, HD Zero or Analog, have a look down in the video description. I'll put a list of parts down there so you can see what I would recommend if I was building it out myself. Now with toothpick builds, weight is always a really important consideration. So if we look at the frame weight of the AOS T3, it comes in at 10.5 grams. And if we include the stack screws, that brings it up to 12.9 grams. If we look at a whole build, a whole build with a Naked Vista and Nebula Pro camera comes in at 78.5 grams. And if we include a 450 milliamp power 3S, that brings us up to 122.4 grams. And that's probably the heaviest that you could ever think to build this quad out. If you were to use something like the 25 millimeter HD Zero board, a lighter weight 300 or 350 milliamp hour battery and maybe move down to a nano sized camera rather than this uh, Nebula Pro camera that I've got in here, you could certainly build it out much, much lighter than that. So it wouldn't be an AOS frame launch unless we looked at the resonance performance of the T3. And these are the first six resonant modes of the AOS T3. And we can see that I've split them into three categories. The first one is this blue category, and these are bending modes. This is where the motor is bending the arm up and down. And these modes don't typically come through really strongly on the gyro because, as you can see, they don't really cause much rotation of the flight controller. Mainly the flight controller is moving up and down slightly, and the gyro isn't very sensitive to that. It's mainly sensitive to rotation. You can see that the little bracing strut here does provide some extra stiffness in this bending mode. And we see that there is more bending going on outside of that bracing strut than inside. So it does add a little bit of extra stiffness and help increase that resonant mode slightly. We can see that the first mode of the T3 is at a really high frequency. 
So all frames are going to have resonances. If someone tells you that a frame design doesn't have resonances, that's a red flag because they all must do. It's a, a law of physics. And having it this high at 200 hertz means that you're getting the benefit of all the filters in Betaflight, the RPM filter, the dynamic notch filter, and the low pass filters on the D term are all acting to attenuate frequencies that are that, are that high. And so you're, you can be confident that it's not going to be getting through to the PID loop. There's another resonant mode at 256 hertz that has all the motors bouncing up and down together. And again, the same is true. When we come on to the torsional modes, these are the ones that are really problematic for traditional toothpick frame designs like the TP3. When you've got the motors rotating on the end of the arm like this, it does cause rotation of the flight controller and the gyro is really sensitive to those types of rotations. If you have a long, thin, unsupported arm, these resonant frequencies can occur really low, well below 200 hertz, and in a region where they can actually come through and affect the PID loop. The filters really don't work quite so well at low frequencies below 200 or 150 hertz. There's not as much attenuation, so you have to be really careful if you've got any resonant modes down that low. The AOS T3, on the other hand, you can see the torsional modes start at 280 hertz, and there's one at 284 and one at 287. That's quite typical to have three modes close together because it's just different motors that are rotating on the arm. You've got the left and right, the top and the bottom, and then all of them moving together. You can see that the strut here that comes from the middle of the frame out to the arm is providing a fantastic amount of support for these twisting torsional modes because the arm really can't twist beyond that strut because of that wide base there at the, at the root of the arm. And so all the twist is confined to just this very short length between the stabilizing strut and the motor. And that adds a lot of stiffness and helps push those resonant frequencies up really high, nearly 300 hertz in this case, so that again the filters can be really effective and eliminate those vibrations without introducing any significant delay to the PID loop. The final mode here is another torsional mode. You can see that it's going to be mainly affecting the yaw axis because of how the flight controller is yawing back and forth. But up at 429 hertz, again, the frequency is so high that you can filter that out without introducing much delay. And that's really the key when you're looking at resonant frame design. You're not trying to get rid of resonances so much as you are trying to shift them to nice high frequencies and separate them out as far as possible. And that's what I've tried to do here and I think done reasonably well with the AOS T3. Of course, that's only a theoretical simulation. We want to look at the actual flight performance. So these are some black box logs taken of the AOS T3. And what we're looking for here are these spikes that you might see to do with frame resonances. You can see that there's a broad hump of motor noise here and the second harmonic of the motor noise here. And what we're looking for is little spikes that kind of spike up above that to see where the resonances are. We can see that on roll, there's a little spike here that corresponds to that 200 hertz frame resonance. And another spike here, which corresponds to that 250 hertz resonance but they really don't spike up much above the broadband motor noise. And that's really good. That shows that the resonances are, are not particularly strong on this frame. And that means they're not really going to cause you any problem when you're flying. And they're not going to limit your ability to tune the quad. When we get up higher, we can see a few more little spikes here that are corresponding to the torsional modes. And those appear both on pitch and on roll as well. And this is exactly what we would expect. But the key is that they're at nice high frequencies and that those spikes are very small. That means that all the filtering that you've got active in Betaflight is just going to be able to squash them right down and you're not going to have any issues. And it's going to be able to do that without introducing delay. And that's really the key. You're always going to need filtering and that filtering is always going to introduce delay. So the higher frequencies that you can have these frame resonances at, the less the, the penalty for filtering them out becomes. That's obviously the goal with the frame design. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about the AOS T3. Now, if you're interested to try the frame out for yourself, perhaps because you're building a new 3-inch toothpick drone, 
or because you have an existing toothpick and you'd like to see if swapping the frame can give you even more flight performance, then I'll put links down in the video description below to where you can get hold of one today. If you like the work that I do and would like to support me, as well as getting advance notice of new AOS frame designs and the opportunity to order them before anyone else, I'll put a link to my Patreon down in the video description. You can join from just a few dollars a month and all of your support helps me spend more time making videos like this for you guys. I'm going to leave you now with some freestyle footage from the AOS T3 so you can see how it flies on Betaflight 4.2 with stock PIDs and filters. I'm going to be doing a proper freestyle edit with the drone coming very, very soon. And uh, I hope you enjoy that when it comes out as well. Until next time, I wish you all very, very happy flying.